Hello and welcome to episode 12 of The Second Messiah. In the last episode, Safrax journeyed out from Tarentum hoping to capture Syracuse from the Western Roman Empire. Unfortunately for him, he wasn't the only faction hoping to go and capture that settlement, and the Italians got there first with help from the Visigoths. Everywhere else was too far away, so we had to go home without any new territory. But back at home, the Saxons, controlling the nearby provinces, were facing rebellions, uprisings of Roman forces. While he waited to see the result, Vithericus annexed the Kingdom of Nubasia, having defeated their forces in the episode prior. Safrax got lucky and the rebellion succeeded, allowing him to take these Saxon areas without actually having to declare war on Saxony. Vithericus kept going north from Nobatia and started infringing the Eastern Roman Empire's territory in Egypt and shows no sign of stopping. So Safrax, having captured Regium to his southwest, moved north to capture Neapolis, both of the Saxon territories in his area. And he then kept going north to the ruins of Rome, where he decided to build a new city to be the heart of his Ostrogothic domain. Everything is like unpolished bronze, familiar in shape, but missing the sheen it once had. The hills, the villas and towns, straight and true roads. It is all a part of my heritage, or so I had been thinking. I think I might have drunk a little too much of the Ostrogoth's mead. The future I see is less of the new empire I wanted, and more of the one they wanted. And what they want isn't an empire at all, it's more of a selfish vision. A little part of the world they can have for themselves, shutting everyone else out. I fear that the Empire outside of Italia is not going to be saved. No doubt Lord Safrax and his followers could do it, but he won't listen to me anymore. He is bitter, it seems, even though the advice I gave him has brought us so far. His people have a home, Rome is going to be restored, and the raids by Huns and the barbarian tourists have finally ended. For the people of my homeland and theirs, this is a victory, but no one dares to see it that way out of fear. They sense the calm before the storm, and perhaps rightly so. But they forget that they are protected by warriors proven on the world stage, and leaders who have their interests at heart, free of corruption or malice. Yes, the Ostrogothic way infects me more each day, and I am quite willing to allow it. Welcome back to the Second Messiah, where as Vithericus is making his journey north, taking Eastern Roman we Empire territory, we have a little interruption that might make uh, things a little bit more difficult. Egypt, a Roman separatist faction, has decided to declare war on the Ostrogoths. They control the province just to the west, part of Libya, so they're not going to directly contend for Egypt, but uh, they're very likely to invade while I'm invading Egypt, so we're going to have to fight each other. I'm not going to call any of my allies in, because I don't want to uh, stress them out over this random little conflict, but I think I should be able to win on my own. And we see there right off the Egyptian forces moving west along the coast, so not really sure what they're up to, we'll have to wait and see. So I can use Amalric, my spy, to check out what's going on. You can see Egypt's capital is just to the west of Alexandria, and the place they were moving even further west is owned by one of the desert tribes, so I'm not sure what they're trying to do over there. Anyway, we can see the capital itself has only one unit garrisoning it, I think it's just a, a single admiral there. And the buildings itself look pretty okay, but uh, they're obviously not particularly rich, given that's their only province and we can see they don't have any particularly uh, wealthy infrastructure. I decided to send a Malaric southwest, just in case there were any Egyptian forces on that road, but it didn't appear to be so. So right now I'm basically just going to ignore Egypt and continue on my mission, because although they're threatening me, they're not necessarily actually going to step in until it's too late. So first we just need to wipe out this small Eastern Roman Empire garrison, which I can do with an auto resolve. So Therakos will take the town, and then after this, he needs to move north towards Alexandria. That's going to be the difficult one and the most important of the Eastern Roman Empire settlements in this area that we want to capture. 
So I'll just occupy it and take the replenishment. And next turn I'll be able to move on. I'll need to repair up the town a little bit as well. You can see this town has specialist buildings for building high level cavalry by the looks of it. So I can use these to build Roman special cavalry units uh, once I've got them all repaired up. So that should be nice. I'm going to leave them intact for now, not destroy them and replace them with my own cultural buildings just so I can use oh, that particular great. advantage. Right away though, even before I repair them, I'm able to upgrade my horses and my camels for whatever reason. I guess they were training camels as well in these cavalry camps. So the army's got a little bit better and now we are free to move north since the Egyptians are pretty much doing nothing. I'm also going to start constructing a Chieftain's house back in uh, Bernice, the place I captured in the previous episode, because we're going to have public order problems definitely in these new lands. Back in Italy, the construction of Rome is continuing. It's going to take a long time to rebuild it. And of course, it's now called New Uium rather than Rome, but it will be Rome spiritually to the rest of the world. And speaking of the rest of the world, I thought it was time to have a look around at what's going on. You can see the Gepids, our old ally right from the beginning, are still going on. But a lot of the world over to the east has been destroyed, probably by the Huns. They seem to have cut a large path there out of, sort of Eastern Europe. Interestingly, the places that are still alive are basically part of the Gothic homelands region. So the place we fled right at the beginning, the cause of our migration, is okay. Greece, you can see, isn't faring very well. This time it's not the Huns, I think it's just the warring between the factions has destroyed many of the areas. I think Macedonia was responsible for some of the destruction. Our allies, the Visigoths, are still hanging on there with that settlement they colonized right back near the beginning. And they also have this outpost, <laughs> outpost sorry, here in Corinthius. So they're in a little bit of a precarious situation there. The Asians are still controlling Constantinopolis. They rebuilt it after it was raised by the Huns and seem to have been successful in doing that. Them and the Pontics, and looks like the Judeans as well, are in a war with the Eastern Roman Empire all over Antiochia. The Eastern Roman Empire is holding on really well, actually. They've destroyed a couple of the provinces that they lost, weakening the uh, my allies here who are fighting against them. And it seems the, uh, the Allies have failed, really, to push them out of the region, although rebels have successfully captured some of the Eastern Roman Empire's territory around here. And the Judeans have captured Antiochia, giving them a nice position with uh, two cities right next to each other, two walled cities, a really nice defensive corner they've got there. And uh, all along the Middle East, we can see rebels have taken over a lot of the Roman territory. Overall, I'm not expecting the Eastern Roman Empire to really step in against my campaign, but you can interestingly see here, the Huns got peace with the Eastern Roman Empire. Perhaps they felt threatened, I don't know. They also got peace with one of the Sassanid Empire's random vassals. Now we have news of a food shortage in Italia. This is the second time this has happened. I think it's just because when we go into winter, we have a food shortage because the food supply is unstable. You can see I'm already working on some fishing jetties. So soon we should be in a position where this will stop happening. But at the back of my mind, I'm thinking it would be a lot easier for me to control this particular province if I could kick the Italians out of Florentia, which I need to uh, take the actual province named Italia in this region. But uh, attacking the Italians may not be the best idea. At the moment, they really like me, so it seems almost bad to just go and take their territory because I happen to need it for administrative regions. reasons. Sorry. You can see, curiously, the Huns, the uh, leader of the Huns at least, is over in Burdagala. I'm not sure what they're up to over there, but uh, perhaps they've stopped their rampage through Eastern Europe, but it could mean a rampage through Spain and Gaul is about to begin. I also noted that my Illyrian allies aren't particularly fond of me, which is inconvenient because they're probably one of the most most powerful allies I have. So I was looking at Italia, looking at their relationship to me. I ended up deciding I'm not going to declare war on them just to take that territory, but I'm not going to rule it out in the future. Hear me, Lord, I shield be on sight, source of all light. I ask that you prepare me to complete the missions your Messiah will give me in the years to come. In return, I will let no force of man or demon prevent me from forging your will into reality. Your new world is all I dream of. Your compassion for your children in this dark time brings tears of joy to me at every arrival of the sun. Your power emboldens me to take up the sword and spear, to forfeit my life and ambitions, so that all my resourcefulness, all my labor, all my agency might be in your guiding hands. I beg of you, O Lord, to see us tested fairly and judged according to the honesty of our intent, no matter the result. 
Because public order in Egypt was going to be an issue, I decided I'm going to need a new force to hold this province while Vithericus pushes on with his army. I decided to recruit Roderick, a relentless attacker, as a new general, so if the Egyptians do come anywhere near this province, he should be able to push them out. First though, I'm going to need some forces, and you can see here are those special Roman cavalry units I can recruit, some of the ones I've faced already and some ones I haven't seen before, plus I can recruit these Legio Comitatensis, a nice heavy sword unit. The Roman units take longer to recruit though than Germanic ones, it'll take two turns to recruit each one. And uh, I was just comparing here how the stats balance up, and the thing about Roman units is they're not that much better than the Germanic ones, and in some cases they're worse. So for now I'm just going to recruit a big bunch of Germanic spearmen, because they're going to recruit quickly and that's what I need to deal with the public order. But perhaps later on I'll recruit some more Roman units, particularly the cavalry, because I can't recruit Germanic cavalry anyway, so in an ironic twist the Romans are going to have to be auxiliary cavalry for my Germanic army. Anyway, Vithericus is now totally free to start his march towards Alexandria as he moves up past the pyramid, pyramid sorry, following the Nile and reaches the city. It's undefended by the Eastern Roman Empire as expected. So we'll move in and start the siege. Balance ball very far in our favour, but we'll need to get into the city. And unfortunately, it's going to take three turns for some reason to construct the ladders I need to be able to just auto resolve the assault. So I don't know why it's going to take so long. It usually only takes one turn. And unfortunately, there are no mercenary onages available. So so that means this is going to have to be a protracted siege, and the risk there is that the Egyptians might just come over and decide to attack either Vithericus or my relatively unguarded territories to the south while I'm stuck here doing this siege. But there is no other choice since we're not going to get onages anytime soon, so I order them to start building the ladders, and now they'll sit there for three turns, they're going to spend almost a year preparing a ladder to get over the wall of Alexandria. It better be a good ladder. Meanwhile, Amalric is just going to keep an eye out for the Egyptians, and he indeed sees them. It looks like they're moving back east with a fleet of heavy Roman troops with a few mercenaries thrown in there, some of the troops, the uh, desert defectors, the same ones I'm using. So if they are coming back east, it's possible that in the next turn they intend to make an aggressive move, so we'll have to watch out for that. At the start of the next turn, Egypt rebels. That makes life a little bit harder for me, and there's rebellion in Italia imminent. I get a mission to defeat one of the Roman fleets. I'm not sure why this is of particular importance, but the game thinks I need to take them out. They're just sitting here. These were the guys who were uh, defending Berenice, I think, but ran away and have just sat in the corner. And uh, my council thinks I should kill them, but I'm probably not going to. Vithericus has gained a diplomatic tone out of nowhere, which is quite handy. That just increases the amount of money we can make from trade. Hopefully that affects Saphrax's forces because he's doing all the trade. So using a Malaric, I'm going to take a look for the Egyptians. I moved south on the road and indeed discovered them. They've moved quite far down the road already. It looks like they're going to sweep round and attack my own unguarded provinces while Vithericus is stuck in Alexandria, just like I feared might happen because of the siege. Roderick is the guy who really needs to stop him, but first he needs to deal with these rebels. The re rebel army has spawned right next to him in a convenient twist. So I'm going to ask him to put together a mercenary force to add to the gang of Germanic spearmen that he recruited in the previous turn, and he can just now march out and eliminate the rebels. The question though is whether he'll be able to get past them and move up to stop the Egyptians. Unfortunately I think it's pretty unlikely considering it took two turns for Vithericus to get from the same location over to there. First though let's deal with these rebels. I'm not going to allow the rebellion to grow any bigger before I defeat it, which I could do to help the public order, but because we're in a bit of a dodgy situation I want to have the rebellion just be gone so I don't have to worry about it, and perhaps once the Egyptians have been dealt with will allow a bigger rebellion to happen if we do need one by that point to keep public order. So Roderick in his first battle totally walks over the rebels, no problem whatsoever there. We got rid of them and I'm going to take on warriors to replenish our losses, the losses being mostly among our mercenary phalaxmen curiously. I guess they got a little bit too eager and went in too deep. So as expected I can't reach the town whereas the Egyptians can. A dangerous situation if they take that town, the Therakos will be stuck up there, cut off from our own force and Roderick doesn't have an army that's good enough to actually beat the Egyptians, so he couldn't break back through to save him. My other option though is to cool off the siege and have Vithericus move south to garrison the town himself. Annoying though, since I've already spent one of the three turns I need to start the siege, because that means I'll have to go away, deal with this, and then go back in and restart the three turns. The only hope I had was if a Malaric could hinder the army so that it couldn't reach any of my settlements in this turn. So I pay the money, take the chance, and ask him to go in and try. And luckily for me, I succeeded. 
So Amalric has finally succeeded, the first time he's done something successfully and he levels up as a result. So they've lost movement range, but unfortunately, they still just about have the amount of movement points they need to reach my settlement. So that means that in order to stop myself from risking the loss of that settlement, I'm going to have to abandon this siege, which is very disappointing. So we'll put our third of a ladder down on the ground. The uh, locals are sure to destroy it, so we'll have to rebuild them next time. And Vitheracus will head back south to garrison the settlement. The upside of this is that him being in the settlement will improve public order. For Roderick, since he is probably not going to get involved in this fight with the Egyptians anymore, I decided to disband his mercenaries to get my money back, and then I'm going to send him back to garrison the town as well, again just to help with public order because it's in a real bad state. Although you can see I am keeping my desert defector legionaries because they are so good and I think they are worth the money. So he's going to start recruiting some more forces while he's there, because I think I am going to need a full second stack, especially when Vithericus moves west and the Sassanids could come in from the east at any moment. Progressing forward another turn, we start to get some diplomatic offers. First, Aran, one of the states of the Sassanid Empire, comes to me asking for peace, but I have to pay them quite a large amount in exchange for it, and they're not willing to have peace if the money isn't involved. So their deal is completely thrown out the window. The next deal to come along are these guys right on the western tip of Africa who come to me asking for a defensive alliance. We're currently trading with them and they want me to pay a small amount for a defensive alliance. But since they're in the territory that I intend to capture, that's not a good idea. So they're thrown out as well. Then comes another one of the Sassid Empire's little satrape states. They want a smaller amount of money in exchange for peace. So I'm willing to pay them an uh, even smaller amount. Offer them that and they accept it. So we're now at war with one fewer people, but we're still at war with most of the Eastern world, and the Egyptians, luckily for me, fall back. I heard it right from the quartmaster, and he heard it from a sailor with family in Alexandria. He said there wasn't much doubt about it. A huge army of Ostrogoths, led by Manarion, caused the second Messiah. The king was bloody right, and he, if he's alive, he might still be with them. Incredible, your brother might still be alive too. I can't believe they did it. They found the font of all water and God's new son. Does this mean we are to be saved? As I know Chief Saffrax and the companions, we should forget this place and go help our king, help our lord and savior. Damn it, I'm going back to Taranto. I need to know more. The first stage on the construction of Nova Uyum is complete. We've built the Burg here on the site of Rome. Now we need to destroy a lot of the other rubble in order to make way for the new buildings we're going to set up as part of the city. So it's still going to take quite a long time before the city is functional and useful to me, but we've made good progress here. The fact that Florentia is still being held by the Italians is going to make it a bit more difficult than usual to decide what buildings I'll need, because sanitation could become an issue, so I might have to deal with that uh, sooner rather than building religious conversion buildings or perhaps markets. I was also considering upgrading the Burg to a small city right away. I've got the money to do it, but the problem is that the food consumption increase could be dangerous, especially because Italia, that province, already has food issues, so I decided to leave off from doing that for now. You can see the province has a small rebellion building up in it, but that's not really going to be an issue. I've moved Safarax down to be near the rebellion so they can't steal Neapolis from me. And Ejika is continuing to build up his force, now getting some serious forces in there, including Germanic noble swordsmen and lots of phalxmen. So hopefully he'll be able to put together a powerful force that will even be better than Safarax's. The food shortage in Italia is actually temporarily resolved as a result of uh, constructing fishing jetty, so that's good news. And we get more good news in the form of Fugia, sorry, gaining a new ancillary, an artist, which improves public order, giving us five extra public order per turn. Perfect, considering the uh, province is currently in rebellion, so once the rebellion is dealt with, that's going to make it a lot easier to stop it from happening again. Now back down on the Egyptian front, we need to see what the Egyptian faction is up to. We can see it's got its full stack of troops sitting in its capital now, so it's not advancing towards us in any way. It's not going to sneak back down round towards where Vithericus is. So we're not going to have to defend our territory. So I sort of have two options. I can either move west through the desert and come up the route that the enemy need to use to reach me. That will stop them from doing any rear attacks, but I'll suffer attrition moving through the desert. So it's better for me to go up to Alexandria and then move west along the coast, but I'll need to capture Alexandria, which of course is going to take another three turns. 
So we're going back to the situation that we were in uh, pretty recently where I'm besieging Alexandria and the enemy do have the ability to move south and then east to attack my own territory. The difference this time is that I'm going to move Roderick up to defend that territory and perhaps hire some mercenaries if the enemy do look like they're going to attack. Fortunately, the enemy just stand there. The Egyptians bring a boat in to reinforce their capital, but overall, no action whatsoever. So now Roderick's going to make his run up uh, towards the town so that if they do move out, there'll be no chance of them taking it. But I suspect they're not going to at this point. We're just going to stand off and wait for Alexandria to fall, which shouldn't take too long. Now we have an event, a stonemason, some sort of master stonemason is offering his services to me. I have the option of uh, saying no, killing him, saying yes, or doing nothing. I'm not sure what doing nothing is, not particularly different to saying no. But anyway, so I decide to uh, accept him in and we'll see what the result of, this, uh, of that is sorry, later on. So now we've got a construction slot ready in Nova Uyum. I was considering building the granary to get sanitation going. But actually that's not going to help all that much because the town itself doesn't have any sanitation problems so that's a sort of long term uh, move that I'll need to take. Right now I think I'd rather build the chapel, we need to start converting this place to airing Christianity otherwise we're going to have constant public order issues <laughs> which of course cause these rebellions and that rebellion I'm just going to leave there to build up but unfortunately for me they decided they didn't want to build up, I wanted to build them up as big as possible to improve public order and then I'll just use my two stacks to destroy them but they'd rather get themselves destroyed early on. So uh, just the eight regiments comes in against Saffrax's 20, plus of course the garrison and garrison fleet of Neapolis, and would you believe it, they're completely destroyed. So I don't know what the rebel commander was thinking, but whatever his plan was, it's failed, and I execute all of the survivors. Hopefully that will dissuade them from rebelling again, since I haven't managed to kill them all in battle as I had planned. We have an illegitimate birth to Vidimir, uh, Therakas' son, so he needs to work on his parenting. And now we have news that Gylemy's daughter seems to have heard about the rumours of there being an Austro-Gothic domain back up in Italia and wants to leave our camp to go and seek out Theudis in order to marry him. This seems like a very random match, especially for a high quality daughter, so Vitherakas is going to prevent such folly, but now really bad news. That stonemason that we attempted to hire turned out to be an assassin. He tried to kill Saffrax, but luckily for him, Eutheric stepped out of nowhere and sacrificed himself to save his lord. It seems he's more loyal than Saffrax thought, but we've lost one of our best nobles. Young Eutheric, no one need die for me now. Why did you do this? Uh, search that mason's body. I need to know who sent him. It pains me to say that I can think of many who would wish to see me dead. Unless... Eutheric has not been at my court in years, and likely would not have been again. For the attack to have happened now... Did they get the right man after all? Everyone will think it is me who ordered the attack when they hear about Eutheric. Something darker is at play here. The fact that Theudas claims illness to explain his absence today. No. If I start doubting him, I'll have nothing left. Unless the rumors about the king really are true. With Eutheric dead, I need a new governor for Magna Graecia, and because this province is becoming uh, less important, I want to move my effective capital in this domain up to Nova Uyum. I decided to just give it to one of these minor noble candidates, put them in for now, and I'll probably get rid of them to free up governor slots And once I have some more territory or have someone more useful to put into that slot. So this random guy will have to suffice for now, he's extremely loyal to me, so that's good news. Now down in Egypt, the Theracus has finally constructed the ladders he needs to get over the wall and slaughter the tiny garrison of Alexandria. So he does just that. We wipe them out and uh, this is an important event for two reasons. One, because I'm unifying the province, province of Egypt under my rule and two, because in my opinion this is the point at which Theracus would finally learn of the existence of Saffrax and the Ostrogothic domain. The travellers and merchants of Alexandria would easily provide the information he needs the two parts of the Ostrogothic kingdom are now going to become aware of each other in this narrative. Vitherakus is still under threat though because the Egyptian military is just one turn's march away. To counter it, it looks like I have a large variety of units I can recruit. And I can actually recruit them with silver chevron experience right away because of my ancillaries and bonuses. So that's definitely a tempting idea. 
Back in Italy, I was thinking of actually just kicking Safrex out of his army so he could do something else, perhaps become the governor of Magna Gratia, and confusingly, one of the generals I could replace him with was Eutheric. Not the same Eutheric, it seems, a guy who has different hair and is a lower level. But perhaps uh, the Gothic nobles have taken to naming themselves after Eutheric after his heroic sacrifice to save their leader. So that was nice to see, but in the end I didn't replace Safrax as the general. Instead, what I decided to do was basically retire him to just being a garrison of Magna Gratia. So I gave some of his troops to Educa and his new army, the Sentinels of Arius, who is now going to move north to garrison Nova Uyum. He also needs to be there for public order reasons, but his actual goal is to attack Italia. He is going to start the campaign, the campaign he so much wanted, but not quite yet. First, he's going to ease into this, starting welcome, by just breaking welcome, off our alliance friend. with Italia. We I liberated them, so they owe us a great debt, and now we're going to recall that debt in the form of invading their territory to unify one of our provinces, but yes, not quite yet, so we'll have to wait one turn before Educa is going to start his campaign there. And meanwhile, Safranx is going to wait down in Tarentum and perhaps uh, liaise with Vithericus' his new king to see what's going on. Now, for Vithericus, we have an offer, another offer concerning our family's daughters, Gailemir's daughter. It's the Emperor of Judea wanting to marry her, so quite a fine match, uh, and I probably would have accepted this offer if only Vithericus hadn't just learned of the existence of the rest of his kingdom still flourishing in Italia. He already has other plans for that particular daughter. You can see here the forces of Mazun, one of the Sassanid vassals, have actually moved over towards Italia, so it's possible that uh, Safrax is about to face some Sassanid-inspired aggression. Now, the Italians come back after we broke These their alliance with an offer, non-aggression if I give them loads of money. Obviously I reject that out of hand, it seems they think they're more powerful than me. We have a new event to consider, Tribute. This event's not particularly good actually because it doesn't tell you who the tribute's supposed to be from. Someone has sent you tribute and you have the option to ignore it, accept it or kill the bearer. So I'll accept the tribute and perhaps we'll find out who it was later on. Now, as for Gailemir's daughter, I am going to marry her to Safrax, or at least offer Safrax the hand. We're finally going to unify the effective king of the Ostrogothic domain with the real king of the, of the full Ostrogothic people, and of course, soon to be the king of the New World if the Second Messiah gets his way. So that offer is sent, and now Vithericus needs to look to military matters. The Egyptian army is still there and still threatening us, and we're probably going to have to take them out. So he marches out to begin a siege of their capital. The balance bar is about even, a situation where it's possible that I could win by doing a siege attack, but I might as well see if the enemy are willing to make it a field battle instead, because that would make it a little bit easier for me. So I'll besiege them for a turn and see if the enemy sally out during the end turn sequence there. So Educa is now ready to start his campaign. First, he needs to declare war on the state of Italia. We're not calling any allies in. This is basically between him and the defenders of Florentia. So he moves right in for an attack. But unfortunately, it seems the enemy's defensive force is much more powerful than we'd estimated. It's got a massive advantage on the balance bar, and the garrison of the town is very large, with loads of those legio comitatensis. So Educa's force isn't uh, likely to win this battle, at least according to the game. So I fall back. What I wanted to do with Educa is try and draw the main force out to fight a field battle and then maybe go back to take the town. But of course, things might not go my way. We'll find out what happens next time. decisive battles for both halves of the Ostrogothic Kingdom next time on the Second Messiah.